Welcome to Great Chapters of the Bible. We continue our study of Genesis chapter 1. Having formed creation in days 1 to 3, God now goes on to fill creation in days 4 to 6. And there's a clear parallel between the two sections. In day 1, God creates light. In day 4, he creates lights. In day 2, he creates the firmament, the atmosphere, and the waters below. And in day 5, he creates birds to fly in the firmament and fish and maritime life to populate the sea. In day three, God creates the dry land and vegetation. In day six, he creates animals and man who will live on the dry land. In the study, we're going to deal with days four to six, but we're going to leave the creation of man until the next study. So let's read this section together, Genesis chapter one and beginning at verse 14. And God said, let there be lights in the firmament of the heaven to divide the day from the night. And let them be for signs and for seasons and for days and years. And let them be for lights in the firmament of the heaven to give light upon the earth. And it was so. And God made two great lights, the greater light to rule the day and the lesser light to rule the night. He made the stars also. And God set them in the firmament of the heaven to give light upon the earth and to rule over the day and over the night and to divide the light from the darkness. And God saw that it was good and the evening and the morning for the fourth day. And God said, let the waters bring forth abundantly the moving creature that hath life and fowl that may fly above the earth in the open firmament of heaven. And God created great whales and every living creature that moveth, which the waters brought forth abundantly after their kind, and every winged fowl after his kind. And God saw that it was good. And God blessed them, saying, be fruitful and multiply, and fill the waters of the seas, and let fowl multiply in the earth. And the evening and the morning were the fifth day. And God said, Let the earth bring forth the living creature after his kind, cattle, and creeping thing, and beast of the earth after his kind. And it was so. And God made the beast of the earth after his kind, and cattle after their kind, and everything that creepeth upon the earth after his kind. And God saw that it was good. Having created the foundation or the framework of creation, God now populates the vast spaces that he has created. Let's look at day four. God said, Let there be lights. Here we have the creation of the stars and the planets. This is fascinating. There's a lot about outer space that we don't know. The scientists are constantly pushing the envelope and trying to explore further and further into space and we've become used to phrases such as dark matter, black holes, galaxies that we never knew existed, multiverses. It seems to just go on and on and the more that man can discover and explore the more it seems there is something beyond and something beyond the, the great vast space that is filled now with planets and stars. Cosmology is a mind-boggling fascinating discipline but what we have in this chapter is the relationship of these heavenly bodies to man. We must remember this chapter is all about really the creation of man and so everything is seen in its relationship to man, the climax of God's creation. Now these verses teach us that there were four functions designed for the stars and planets. First of all, they were created in order to illuminate. We get that quite clearly, that they were to shed light upon the earth. Secondly, they were created in order to educate. They were for signs. And the idea here is that they would form a kind of symbol language that could be interpreted by everyone living upon the earth. People would look up into the skies and would be able to get a message. They would be educated as to the glory of God, the wisdom of God, the power of God, but also in some way perhaps to his redemptive plan as well. You remember that in the New Testament, the wise men came and they said, we have seen his star in the east and we have come to worship him. The stars had a role in educating mankind. So first of all, to illuminate. Secondly, to educate. Thirdly, to regulate, because we understand that the planets and the stars would have an influence upon the earth, a beneficial influence, an influence for good. And so there would be a power exerted by these heavenly bodies on planet earth. And the Bible talks about ruling. And then fourthly, they were created in order to differentiate, to divide between the light and the darkness, day and night. And so we've got these four functions that are clearly stated here. First of all, illumination, education, then regulation, and finally, differentiation. And the passage we've read tells us of three specific groups, the sun, 
the moon and the stars. The writer refers to the sun to rule the day, the greater light, and then the lesser light, the moon, uh, to rule the night. And then almost as an afterthought or an aside, and he made the stars also. This is quite astounding because in that little sentence, that little phrase, he made the stars also, there's enough in the study of the stars to take up the lifetimes of millions of scientists. And yet, in the great plan of God, it's all seen in relation to man. And so there's more information given to us about the creation of man than there is about the creation of the stars. He made the stars also. Now, a contemplation of these celestial bodies will always fill our hearts with wonder and amazement. And it's interesting, there are two main psalms written by David that have to do with the celestial bodies, the planets and the stars. And if you read Psalm 19, you'll find that he is amazed at the daytime sky. He talks about the sun, and as the sun rises, he uses this picture of a bridegroom going out of his chamber in all his glory. And then as it moves across the sky, he talks about it like a strong man running a race. And it's the daytime sky that's really amazing, David. When you come to Psalm 8, you find it's the nighttime sky. He says, when I consider uh, the heavens, and he speaks about the moon and the stars that thou hast ordained, what is man that thou art mindful of him? And so David is looking at the sky in the day, and he's looking up at the sky at night, and wherever he looks in this great firmament, in the great vast space that can be seen, he is amazed and thrilled by the glory of God. So instead of the heavens being a massive blank canvas, God has now studded the heavens with these jewels that have caused wonder and amazement and have had a beneficial effect upon the earth and have been used, of course, uh, to navigate and to direct and to guide. And so in so many ways, these planets and stars have been created for the benefit of man on earth. When we look at day number five, God begins to create life. He creates marine life to fill the sea, and he creates avian life, birds that will fly in the firmament in the air. Notice, first of all, their vitality. This is emphasized again and again. It talks about creatures that have life, living creatures. And this is now life being created in a new form. We've had vegetable life already created in day number three. But there is something quite different here. God is creating a distinct form of life in creating the fishes and the birds, and the vitality of these creatures is emphasized. And not only that, but their vivacity is emphasized as well. Uh, the literal rendering, for example, of let the waters bring forth abundantly is let the waters teem with teeming life. And there's this idea of of incessant movement, constant movement. And so the sea is swarming with marine creatures and the air is filled with birds flying in the heavens. And so we have this picture not only of life, but of active life, of motion, constant motion all the time. And then we get the thought of variety. And so the verses talk about great whales. That's at the upper end of the marine scale. And then you think down at the lower end, you scoop up out of a rock pool a handful of water, or out of even a ditch in the countryside, scoop up a handful of water and put it under the microscope and you'll find it is swarming, it's teeming with life of different forms. And there's a tremendous variety, whether we think of the, the creatures that inhabit the sea or we think of the birds that fly in the air, a tremendous variety. God is a God of variety. And so we'll come back to this again as we go through the creation. Vitality, vivacity, and variety. These are the hallmarks of God's creation. Now you might ask, why did God create these life forms? It seems evident that at the beginning, man was a vegetarian. We read that later on in the chapter. And also the animals that were created, they were vegetarian as well. And so they were not created initially to provide food for man, although that came in later on. So why did God create all these animals? Well, I think the reason is simply this, that he created them for his pleasure, for his glory, and for the enjoyment and education of man. And also, crucially, we're going to see this in the next study, to provide an arena for man to exercise his dominion over the animal creation. God's plan was that Adam would rule over creation and that these creatures would all be responsive to him, that they would instinctively look up to Adam as they did right at the beginning. They would instinctively look up to Adam as their head, their creatorial head. And so they would be under his guidance and rule and direction. When sin came into the world, everything changed, everything was spoiled. But this explains to us, I think, in some measure, how 
animals responded to the Lord Jesus when he was here. They instinctively recognized their head. Here was a man who had the dignity of the head of the race. The Bible talks about the Lord Jesus as the last Adam. And so it's interesting that where we find the animal creation in contact with the Lord Jesus, invariably they submit to him because he is the last Adam. And notice, please, for the first time in verse 22, it's recorded that God blessed them. There seems to be a special pleasure, a special care over these creatures that God is creating. He tells them to be fruitful and to multiply and to fill the seas and to fill the skies. And he has an interest, a benevolent interest in what he has created. Well, when we come to the New Testament, the Lord Jesus reminds us that the worthless sparrow that are sold almost for nothing in the marketplace, that there is not one sparrow that falls to the ground, the Lord Jesus says, without your father. In other words, without your father knowing, without your father taking note. And so I think that we, we little appreciate how much the animal creation, uh, the fish of the sea, the fowls that fly in the air, the animals that move on the land, we little appreciate what they mean to God, God's care for them. Then in day six, God creates land animals. Three specific classes are mentioned, the cattle, the creeping things, and the beasts of the earth. I suppose we have the first classification of land animals here. We have the domesticated animal, we have the insect, or perhaps the reptile, and then we have the wild animal. Again, when we read this, we're impressed by vitality, vivacity, and variety. These creatures are designed to live on the dry land, and so they're created on the same day as man is created. Many of these creatures are used later in the Bible as pictures and illustrations of the Lord Jesus. For example, the lion is used to illustrate the kingly dignity, the power of the Lord Jesus. He's the lion of the tribe of Judah. The lamb, on the other hand, is used to illustrate his innocence and his submissiveness. And we read, for example, of the ox as a picture of the patient labor of the Lord Jesus, his patient service for God. These are all used as wonderful pictures of the Lord Jesus. But we must not think that in these characteristics the Lord Jesus resembles, for example, a lion. It's actually the other way around. The lion was designed in such a way as to provide a picture of the character of the Lord Jesus. These creatures, many of them, were designed to furnish us with illustrations of the character of the Lord Jesus Christ. Now notice down through the passage the repeated phrase, after their kind, after their kind. This is teaching us that there are distinct species within the animal creation and that there can be no crossing over the boundary of these species. And so the theory of evolution not only goes against nature, but it is completely contradicted by scripture. When we read Paul's letter to the Corinthians, he reminds the Christians that there is one flesh of men, another flesh of beasts, another flesh of fishes, another flesh of birds. And so each creature has its own species. And so up to this point, the world is formed with lush vegetation and it is teeming with life. The sea is full of life. The creatures of the earth are moving across the face of the earth. The birds are flying in the open firmament. And what God has done at this point is he has created a kingdom. For a kingdom, three things are necessary. First of all, territory. Secondly, subjects. And thirdly, laws. Well, God has created this wonderful territory, the physical creation, and he has populated it. He has filled it. It is teeming with a, a varied, amazing life, whether it be fish or bird or land creature. And he has incorporated into his creation natural laws that will govern that creation. The only thing that is missing from this kingdom is a king, and that king is Adam. And he's just about to arrive. And so this chapter presents us with this wonderful picture of a pristine creation. God has said again and again, it was good, it was good, it was good. Everything is perfect as far as God is concerned. He sees it all and he appreciates it all and he enjoys it all. And it is just waiting for the arrival of man. Now we know that sin spoiled everything. But Paul tells us that creation is looking forward and longing for a day that is coming when under the rule of the second man, the last Adam, the Lord Jesus, it will know far greater glories than it has ever known 
in the past. Thank you for watching. If you have any questions about what you've heard, please contact me. Thank you.